Hallelujah. Thank God for saving you. Hallelujah. Um, if you have your Bibles or if you, if you have your notes, uh, the, the young people you can go to your class if you'll stand. Uh, we are in, we're going to be studying over the next uh, few months uh, great doctrines. And, you know, when we think about doctrine, we a lot of times our mind goes to one scripture, which we hinge all the basic truths and fundamentals of the apostolic message. We go, to, we get out the Acts and the 238s. Chop them down, shoot them up. Uh, but, you know, there are great doctrines in the Word of God besides Acts 238. It is necessary for us to be born again of the water and of the Spirit. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus chapter uh, 3 and John chapter, uh, verse 5. Uh, we know that Jesus gave Peter the keys to the kingdom because when he asked the question, who do you say that I am? And they begin to say, or the disciples begin to say, uh, well, some say this, and some say that you are this, and others say, but Jesus, wait a minute, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ. He said, he didn't say, say a Christ, but he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commended him by saying, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you. And then on the day of Pentecost, when he begins to preach his first message, and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? Thank God for someone that was not mealy mouthed then, was not a uh, jellyfish, but he had a backbone, and he stood and told them what they must do. Repent of your sins, be baptized, every one of you, he didn't just single out John, Joe, or Pete, or Mary, you know, Jane. But he said, uh, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children, even as many as our, the Lord our God shall call. Save yourself from this and toward generation. You know, we could put 2011 in there. This is a generation that... They have no idea where they're going and they really don't care where they're going just as long as they go somewhere. Yes. But uh, tonight, uh, in this first part of our uh, lesson, the Word of God, the inspiration of the Word, God read. And Psalms 119, uh, verse 89 to 96, uh, says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances for all thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delight, I should then have perished in my affliction. I will never forget thy precepts. For with them thou hast quickened me. For I am thine, save me, for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Uh, let's just worship the Lord tonight. Gracious Father, we're so thankful, Lord, for this time, for this opportunity, O oh Lord, to look into your word, to hide your word in our heart. O oh Lord, to know the foundation on which we stand is a solid rock. O oh God, and the truth that we hold on to, these precious truths, Lord, from your word that we hide in our heart. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And you may be seated in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Paul told this young man all Scripture, not some, a few verses here, pick and choose which one you want, but he said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. 
The scriptures are God's inspired and infallible gift to mankind to give him clear instruction for salvation and godly living. I'm so glad to know that we have the instruction manual. We have God's word, not just to tell us how to get to heaven, but how to live day by day and day to day, being a godly woman, a godly man, uh, until uh, we reach that state of perfection. Uh, in his defense of the deity of Christ, in the book, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, he wrote these words. He said, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any uh, patronizing Nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So we see Lewis's base for his reasoning on the profession Jesus made as his uh, to his own identity. Uh, since Jesus claimed to be the Messiah and identify himself as one with the Father, there can no, uh, be no middle ground in assessing his identity. He was either who he said he was, or he was not what he claimed to be. Uh, we have two options that are available. Uh, he was mistaken, or he was intentionally deceptive. Uh, we can accept his testimony as he declared Jesus Christ to be both Lord and God. Uh, scripture makes it specific claims to its origin, the nature and the reliability. And since it does profess to be the word of God, we are left with, but with two choices. The Bible is either what uh, it claims to be or it is not. Uh, either it was written by uh, deluded men who thought they were writing at the behest of God, but were deceived, or it was written by dishonest people in knowing attempt to deceive and be dishonest to people of their uh, uh, to their to be a deceptive uh, readers of their nature of work. Uh, the last two uh, opinions or options are unreasonable. We see that the, the writers, if the writers were deluded, uh, there would be such, they, they could not have produced such work of splendor, such work of majesty and consistency. You see, uh, of the history in the Old Testament, the prophetic words that went through and that was fulfilled centuries later everything to the dotting of the I and the crossing of the T so if they were some kind of a lunatic writing a bunch of words on paper how could these you know come together in such consistency if they were deceivers 
they would have been unable to produce a work of such high moral content. When you study the, the moral tones that are found in the written Word of God, and when I think about the moral decay of 2011, they would, there would be nobody in their right mind to sit down to pen words such as what's in we would find in the Word of God. And yet, we have a, the, the word of more than 400 verses in the Old Testament that says, Thus saith the Lord. The Bible includes warnings against tampering the text. We can find it in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2, Proverbs chapter 30 and verses 5 and 6. The New Testament claims the highest authority for Scripture. It, it is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Scripture was not of human origin. The holy men who uh, participated in the writing of the Scriptures were moved on by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21. Uh, faith accepts Scripture's claims to be the very Word of God. It is not just merely great human literature. I know some colleges and universities, they have now what they call an uh, ancient history uh, where they use the Word of God as just basically a literature book. In some uh, English classes, they use the Bible as just a mere literature book, not to study theology, not to get in depths of doctrines and what this church teaches or what, and they only get into trying dissecting what the word means. But they go in through uh, just as great philosophy. But we see that the word is given by inspiration of God. And it is the uh, inerrant and infallible word. Our preamble to the Articles of Faith of the United Pentecostal Church International uh, says it well. It says, we believe the Bible to be the inspired, to be inspired of God, the infallible word of God. The Bible is the only God-given authority which man possesses. Therefore, all doctrine, faith, hope, and all instruction for the church must be based upon and harmonized with the Bible. It is to be read and studied by all men everywhere and can only be clearly understood by those who are anointed by the Holy Spirit. And our foundational scripture that is based upon this preamble is 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. The scripture was given by or of inspiration. The New Testament writers use the Greek word uh, graphi 23 times. And each time that word appears, that Greek word appears, it is in reference to scripture. The spelling of graphi is the, in the nominative case which means the subject of the sentence or the clause. The word also appears in the accusative case, indicating the direct object. It is notated four times. And in the genitive case, indicating possession three times. Regardless of the case, the reference is always to Scripture. We see the Greek verb, uh, grapho, means write. But the noun graphe refers to a specific kind of writing. It's not just people having an idea and writing some words down on a piece of paper and make sure that it kind of flows together. But this writing is the writing that is inspired by God. And this includes the, in, or is included in the canon of the scripture. When Paul wrote 
that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, the New Testament was still in the work of process. It wasn't a completed work, but it is a work in process to, uh, to be written. Uh, it would be a mistake to think that the limits that Paul referred to of the Old Testament, while the Old Testament is described as Scripture, so is the New Testament. Uh, Peter wrote that in all of Paul's letters, there are some things that are hard to, under to, to be understood, uh, which they are unlearned, unstable, risked, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. We see that Peter considered Paul's letter to be scripture. In the same letter, Peter also declared like Paul that the scripture is the result of the work of the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 and, uh, and verse 21 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God. Woo, hallelujah. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We see that Paul also claimed divine authority for what he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or, a, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandment of the Lord. Even if one were not to attribute the uh, uh, authorship of uh, the book of Hebrews. We no one know for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some says it was Paul. Others said it could have been you know, some of the other writers. Uh, when they kind of, when you, if you go through to read the book of Hebrews compared to Paul's other writing, the, uh, the way the word, the phrasing is in Hebrews doesn't line up with uh, Paul's writing. Uh, it could have been one of those books that uh, he had somebody else write and he was di di just dictating and so they kind of used their own flow of penmanship in, in formulating the words. But uh, regardless, the Apostle Paul, he has contributed or has contributed to 27% of writing the New Testament. Do you realize that is nearly one-third of the New Testament is, is because Paul contributed to writing to the churches. We see that according to both Peter and Paul, at least uh, a significant portion of the New Testament is authoritative scripture. Paul used the word scripture nine times in his writings. And on one of the occasions he wrote in verse Timothy chapter 5 verse 18. For the scripture saith. What did the scripture say? And he takes two portions of scriptures in this particular verse. It says, uh, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now that's 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 18. And that is one scripture verse. But Paul brings together two verses. And that first portion of that verse. For the scripture said that thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Is found in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 25 and verse 4. The last portion of verse 18 comes from Luke's writing in Luke chapter 10 and verse 7. Paul placed the Old Testament and the New Testament side by side, declaring that both are Scripture. He didn't separate the Old from the New. 
Here in verse 18, he put the two scriptures side by side, established them. We see that Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, he penned 28% of the New Testament. Uh, when Peter described the purpose of his second letter, he wrote that it was his readers, that they would be mindful of the words which were spoken before and by the holy prophets of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Uh, by referring to the words of the holy prophets and the commandments of the apostles together in this way, we see that Peter, once again, reaffirms that the words of the apostles are authoritative as the words of the uh, Hebrew prophets. And uh, since he wrote earlier in his letter the words of the holy men, he res uh, resulted from moving of the Holy Spirit. And since he wrote later in his letter that Paul's writings were scripture, it is clear that Peter also considered the writings of the apostles, not just his own, but he included all the apostles to be inspired scripture, all equally authoritative with the Hebrew scriptures. We see that the apostle John wrote five of the New Testament books. In the last of them, uh, John said in uh, Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19, when John said, that, you know, he be, as he began to pen his words, the let, this last letter, the, the part of the revelation to the church. But he said, "There's, you know, he, you look at there's no indication that he thought any less of his other writings. He didn't hold one writing above another writing." But here in Revelation chapter 22, he says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. We see that all 27 books of the New Testament bear the marks of inspiration, including those not included previously, which were Mark's writing, Hebrews, and the book of Jude. Uh, the book of Mark is identified itself as a declaration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. And it is, is the first of the gospels to be written. Uh, Mark's cousin, he was an apostle, and his name is Barnabas. Uh, you can find it in uh, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10. And also in, in Acts chapter 14 and verse 14. Mark was so close to Peter that Peter considered him to be a son. See how these apostles took in younger folks and mentored them, took them under their wing, said, Mark, I see a great potential in you. God's going to use you. Peter took young Timothy under his wing. He said, Timothy, I know your grandmother. I know your mother. And you are going to be used of God. And Paul encouraged him. You know, take the things that you have learned and that you've heard as from a young child. I'm not sure how old Timothy would have been at this time. He would still have been a young man in that day and age, still probably considered a child, even though he might have been, say, 18 or 25. But he was very young when Paul uh, assigned him to his first church. Paul was all nervous because he knew that those people that he assigned that church to was pretty wicked, and they could uh, probably chew him up and devour him, but he prayed for Timothy that he would have a backbone, and Timothy did well. Timothy stood strong. But we see that uh, Mark uh, 
He was mentored and uh, was considered a son of Peter. Uh, Mark apparently was taught by Peter so that his gospel was received by believers as to be a thor uh, an apostolic authority. The book of Hebrews, uh, as I said, does not contain an identity of its author, but it is in complete harmony with a lot of P uh, Paul's letters. The book of Hebrews identifies itself as a word of exhortation. Uh, we see that uh, there was Clement of uh, Rome in his book. Uh, he wrote in AD of 96. He also quotes from the scripture in his book. Uh, Jew, like James, was the... Uh, the brother of Jesus. And in his content of his letter, it is remarkable the harmony uh, with the content or the content of 2 Peter. James, uh, Jude's brother, is specifically identified as an apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 7. Here, this is the, the beginning. This is the foundational part of a, of a doctrine that we stand on. You have so many people, they want to try to discredit the Bible. It's a lot of good reading material. You know, it's got murder. It has mystery, poetry. There's even uh, music in the, in the songs that can be sung. A lot of great history. And you can follow through from the beginning of time, whether your people, some people discredit the Garden of Eden, if it ever really existed. Did the great deluge or the flood, did it destroy just a portion of a world, of the earth, or was the water covering the whole face of the earth? Uh, you know, but we believe in one word, to be the total word. I'm not just saying a word. I'm talking about the word. You can't separate the word by having just a word. Oh, hallelujah. And this is the, a, a fundamental. This is the doctrinal basis. We have to have the, the book that we believe to be infallible in errors. Uh, in closing tonight, the word translated inspiration means God breathe. What did he do when he created Adam? He breathed into his nostrils life. A few days later, he makes a woman. Whoa, man. When he made woman, he did the same thing that he did to Adam. Scraped up some dirt, and maybe add some water to it, make some mud, and made a form. But he didn't just leave her out there on the sand or in the dirt to dry out. But there, he breathed into her, and she became a living soul. The same inspiration as these holy men of God, the prophets of old, the apostles of the New Testament, as God moved upon them, inspired them, He breathed upon them His Word. He breathed His Word into them. They were moved to begin to write, to inscribe. Uh, even the Apostle Paul, when he was unable to write because of the stocks and bonds, well, he had a secretary. As the Spirit began to move upon him, he said, Luke, get your pen and paper out. But we know that Dr. Luke uh, was a lot of his personal traveling companion. And so we don't know how much time Luke spent in the jailhouse either. And not, not that he was a, Luke was a, a prisoner, but uh, just there visiting, taking notes. But we see that when... The Apostle Paul began to feel inspired. Okay, it's time to get the pen out. And he would write if he had freedom to write. If he wasn't, he said, okay, Luke, or whoever was closest, 
Yet you can get some paper. It's time to write. The fact that God breathed Scripture means that Scripture has divine authority. And it's for this reason that all Scripture is profitable. For what? Doctrine? For reproof? For correction? For instruction in righteousness? Uh, it is ins the inspiration that causes Scripture to be the means by which man, the man of God, may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Oh, hallelujah. You know, it, w we need to be able to be sharp with the Word. And that's why Paul also told Timothy, study the Word that you might rightfully divide the word of truth. Not dissect it just to get what you want and think, well, this is what the Scripture says or well, this is what I think it means or this is what I think it says. But study it. And rightly divide it out. The word of truth. Thy word is truth, the psalmist David said. I'm so glad to know that we can stand upon this word. It's the word of God. Aren't you glad that God never lies? If he doesn't lie, we can count on his and we can take it to the bank. Neither will his word. Oh, hallelujah. Let's all stand tonight and let's just lift our hands and love the Lord.